Let me ask you about uh, the war in Ukraine. Why did Russia invade Ukraine on February 24th, 2022? What are some of the explanations given and which do you find the most convincing? Well, clearly the conventional wisdom is that Putin uh, is principally responsible. Putin is an imperialist. Uh, he's an expansionist. He's, That's the conventional thinking. Uh, yeah, yeah. And the idea is that uh, he, he uh, is bent on creating a greater Russia. Uh, and even more so, he's interested in dominating Eastern Europe, if not all of Europe. Um, and that Ukraine was the first stop on the train line. Uh, and what he wanted to do was to conquer all of Ukraine, uh, incorporate it into a greater Russia, and then he would move on and conquer other countries. This is the conventional wisdom. My view is there is no evidence, uh, let me emphasize, zero evidence to support that argument. Which part that he would, the imperialist part, the sense that he would, he sought to conquer all of Ukraine and move on and conquer. There's no evidence he was interested in conquering all of Ukraine. There was no interest, in, there's no evidence beforehand that he was interested in conquering, conquering any of Ukraine. And there's no way that an army that had 190,000 troops at the most, right, could have conquered all of Ukraine. Just impossible. As I like to emphasize, when the Germans went into Poland in 1939, uh, and the Germans, you want to remember, were only intent on conquering the western half of Poland because the Soviets, uh, who came in later that month, were going to conquer the eastern half of Poland. So the western half of Poland is much smaller than Ukraine. And the Germans went in with 1.5 million troops. Uh, if uh, Vladimir Putin were bent on conquering all of Ukraine, he would have needed at least 2 million troops. I would argue he'd need 3 million troops because not only do you need to conquer the country, you then have to occupy it. Uh, but the idea that 190,000 troops was sufficient for conquering uh, all of Ukraine is not a serious argument. Furthermore, he was not interested in conquering Ukraine. And that's why in March 2022, this is immediately after the war starts, he is negotiating with Zelensky to end the war. There are serious negotiations taking place in Istanbul involving the Turks, and Naftali Bennett, who was the Israeli prime minister at the time, was deeply involved in negotiating with both Putin and Zelensky to end the war. Well, if he was interested, Putin, in conquering all of Ukraine, why in God's name would he be negotiating with Zelensky to end the war? And of course, what they were negotiating about was NATO expansion into Ukraine, which was the principal cause of the war. Uh, people in the West don't want to hear that argument because if it is true, which it is, then the West is principally responsible for this bloodbath that's now taking place. And of course, the West doesn't want to be principally responsible. It wants to blame Vladimir Putin. Mm -hmm. So we've invented this story out of whole cloth that he is an aggressor, that he's the second coming of Adolf Hitler, and that what he did in Ukraine was try to... Uh, to conquer all of it, and he failed. But uh, with a little bit of luck, he probably would have conquered all of it, and he'd now be in the Baltic states and eventually end up uh, dominating all of Eastern Europe. As I said, I think there's no evidence to support this. So maybe there's a lot of things to ask there. Maybe just to linger on NATO expansion. What is NATO expansion? What is the threat of NATO expansion and why is it such a concern for Russia? NATO was a mortal enemy of the Soviet Union during the Cold War. It's a military alliance which has at its heart the United States of America, which is the most powerful state on the planet. It is perfectly understandable that Russia is not going to want that military alliance on its doorstep. Here in the United States, we have, as you well know, what's called the Monroe Doctrine. And that basically says no great powers from Europe or Asia 
are allowed to come into our neighborhood and form a military alliance with anybody in this neighborhood. Uh, when I was young, there was this thing called the Cuban Missile Crisis. The Soviets had the audacity to put nuclear-armed missiles in Cuba. We told them in no uncertain terms that that was not acceptable and that those missiles had to be removed. This is our backyard, and we do not tolerate distant great powers coming into our neighborhood. Well, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And if we don't like great powers coming into our neighborhood, it's hardly surprising that the Russians did not want NATO on their doorstep. Uh, they made that manifestly clear uh, when the Cold War ended and they exacted a promise from us that we would not expand NATO. And then when we started expanding NATO, they made it clear after the first tranche in 1999 that they were profoundly unhappy with that. They made it clear in 2004 after the second tranche that they were profoundly unhappy with that expansion. And then in April 2008, when NATO announced that uh, Ukraine and Georgia would become part of NATO, they made it unequivocally clear, not just Putin, that that was not going to happen. They were drawing a red line in the sand. And it is no accident that in August 2008, Remember, the Bucharest summit is April 2008. In August 2008, you had a war between Georgia and Russia, and that involved, at its core, NATO expansion. So uh, the Americans and their allies should have understood by at least August 2008 that continuing to push to bring Ukraine into NATO was going to lead to disaster. And I would note that there were all sorts of people in the 1990s, like George Kennan, William Perry, who was Bill Clinton's Secretary of Defense, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Paul Nitza, and so forth and so on, who argued that NATO expansion would end up producing a disaster, which it has. I would note that uh, at the famous April 2008 Bucharest Summit, where NATO said that Ukraine would be brought into the alliance. Angela Merkel and uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, the German and French leaders respectively, opposed that decision. Angela Merkel later said that the reason she opposed it was because she understood that Putin would interpret it as a declaration of war. Just think about that. Merkel is telling you that she opposed NATO expansion into Ukraine because she understood correctly that Putin would see it as a declaration of war. What did the United States and its friend and friends in Europe do? They continued to push and push because we thought that we could push NATO expansion down their throat after 2008, the same way we did in 1999 and 2004. But we were wrong, and it all blew up in our face in 2014. And when it blew up in our face in 2014, what did we do? Did we back off and say, well, maybe the Russians have some legitimate security interests? No, that's not the way we operate. We continued to double down. And the end result is that in 2022, you got a war. And as I've argued for a long time now, we the West are principally responsible for that, not Vladimir Putin. So the expansion of NATO is primarily responsible. Yeah, for the to put it in more general terms, what we were trying to do was turn Ukraine into a Western bulwark on Russia's border. And it really wasn't NATO expansion alone. NATO expansion was the most important element of our strategy. But the strategy had two other dimensions. One was EU expansion. And the third was the color revolution. We were trying to force orange revolution in Ukraine. And the basic goal there was to turn Ukraine into a pro-Western liberal democracy. And that meant that you'd have Ukraine, if it worked, as a pro-Western liberal democracy that was in the EU and that was in NATO. This was our goal. And the Russians made it unequivocally clear Ukraine was not going to become a Western bulwark on their border. And most importantly, they made it clear that 
Ukraine in NATO was unacceptable. Can we talk about the mind of Vladimir Putin? You've mentioned that this idea that he has aspirations for uh, imperialist conquest, that he dreams of empire is not grounded in reality. He wrote an essay in 2021 about one people. Do you think there is some degree to which he still dreams of the former Soviet Union reuniting? No. He's made it clear that uh, anybody with a, a triple-digit IQ uh, understands that uh, it's nuts to think about recreating the Soviet Union. He thinks it's a tragedy that the Soviet Union fell apart. Mm -hmm. But as he made clear in that essay, the July 12th, 2021 essay, and as he made clear in speeches before, immediately before he invaded Ukraine, he accepted uh, the breakup of the Soviet Union and he accepted uh, the status quo in, in Europe, save for the fact he did not accept the idea that Ukraine would become part of NATO. He's been in power for over two decades. Is there a degree that power can affect a leader's ability to see the world clearly? As they say, corrupt. Um, do you think power has corrupted Vladimir Putin to a degree? It's very hard for me to answer that question because I don't know him and I've not studied him carefully uh, in terms of his overall performance over the course of you know, the 23 years that he's been in power. Uh, I've studied him as a strategist and I've studied how he you know, deals with the West uh, and, you know, deals with the international system more generally uh, since 2014. And I think he is a first-class strategist. This is not to say he doesn't make mistakes, uh, and he admits he's made some mistakes. Uh, uh, but uh, I think that the West is dealing with a formidable adversary here. Uh, and I don't see any evidence that he's either lost speed off his fastball or that power has corrupted his thinking about strategic affairs. So he has consistently put as a primary concern security, as does the United States. He's put for Russia security, making sure that NATO doesn't get close to its borders. I think that's clear, yeah. I, I, I think, as I emphasized early on in our conversation, that leaders privilege security or survival over everything else. And by the way, he gave a number of talks uh, and press conferences uh, in addition to writing that famous article that you referred to on July 12, 2021. So we have you know, a pretty clear record of what he was saying, and I would argue what he was thinking in the run-up to the war in February 2022. And if you read uh, what he said, uh, it's quite clear that he privileged security or survival. He was deeply concerned about the security of Russia. And Russia is a quite vulnerable state in a lot of ways, especially if you think back to what it looked like in the 1990s, as you know better than I do. Uh, it was in terrible shape. Uh, the Chinese talk about the century of national humiliation. One could argue that for the Russians, that was the decade of national humiliation. And, um, and it took Putin, I think, quite a bit of time to bring the Russians back from the dead. I think he eventually succeeded, but uh, it took a considerable amount of time. And I think he understood that he was not playing a particularly strong hand. He was playing something of a weak hand. And he had to be very careful, very cautious. And I think he was. Uh, and I think that's very different than the United States. The United States was the Unipol. It was the most powerful state in the history of the world, most powerful state relative to all its possible competitors from, you know, roughly 1989, certainly after December 1991 when the Soviet Union fell apart, up until, I would argue, about 2017. We were incredibly powerful. And even after 2017, 
up to today, the United States remains the most powerful state in the system. And because of our geographical location, uh, we are in a uh, terrific uh, situation to survive in any great power competition. So uh, you have a situation involving the United States that's different than the situation involving Russia. They're, they're just much more vulnerable uh, than we are. And, and therefore, I think Putin tends to be more sensitive about security uh, than any American president in recent times. Europe on one side, China on the other side. It's a complicated situation. Yeah, and we talked before about 1812 when Napoleon invaded and Moscow got burned to the ground. We talked about World War I where the Russians were actually defeated uh, and surrendered. Uh, and then we talked about 1941 to 1945 where although thankfully uh, the Soviets prevailed, uh, it was... Uh, it, it was a close call, and I mean, the casualties, the destruction that the Soviet Union uh, had inflicted on it by the Germans is just almost almost hard to believe. It is, uh, so they are sensitive. You can understand full well, or at least you should be able to understand full well, why the idea of bringing Ukraine up to their border really spooked them. Uh, I don't understand why more Americans don't understand that. It, it just it it befuddles me. Uh, I think it has to do with the fact that Americans are not very good at putting themselves in the shoes of other countries. Uh, and uh, you really, if if you're going to be a first class strategist in international politics, you have to be able to do that. You have to put yourself in the shoes of the other side and think about how they think, so you don't make foolish mistakes. And a, a, as a starting point. Americans tend to see themselves as the good guys and a, a set of others as the bad guys. And you have to be able to empathize that Russians think of themselves as the good guys. <laughs> the Chinese think of themselves as the good guys. And just be able to empathize if they are the good guys. It's like uh, that uh, funny skit, are we the baddies? Consider the United States could be the bad guys. Like, First of all, em like, uh, See the world, if the United States is the bad guys and China is the good guys, what does that world look like? Be able to just exist with that thought because that is what the Chinese le leadership and many Chinese citizens, uh, if not now, maybe in the future will believe. And you have to kind of do the calculation, the simulation forward from that. And same with Russia, same with, with other nations. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. And just, you know, I always think of Michael McFaul at Stanford, who was the American ambassador to uh, Russia, I think between 2012 and 2014. And uh, he, he told me that he told Putin uh, that Putin didn't have to worry about NATO expansion because the United States was a benign hegemon. And uh, I asked Mike what Putin's response was to that. And uh, Mike said that Putin didn't believe it, uh, and uh, but Mike believed that he should believe it, and that we could move NATO eastward to include Ukraine, and in the end, we'd get away with it because we are a benign hegemon. But the fact is, that's not what Putin saw. Putin saw us as a malign hegemon, and what Mike thinks or any American thinks doesn't matter. What matters is what Putin thinks. But also, the drums of war have been beating for some reason. NATO expansion has been threatened for some reason. So you've talked about NATO expansion being dead. So like, the, it doesn't make sense from a geopolitical uh, perspective on the Europe side to expand NATO. Uh, but nevertheless, that threat has been uh, echoed. So um, why... Has NATO expansion been pushed from your perspective? There are two reasons. One is, first of all, we thought it was a wonderful thing uh, to bring more and more countries into NATO. We thought that it facilitated peace and prosperity. It was ultimately all for the good. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we also thought that uh, uh, countries like Ukraine had a right 
to join NATO. Mm -hmm. These are sovereign countries that can decide for themselves, and the Russians have no say in, in what Ukraine wants to do. And then finally, and uh, this is a point I emphasized before, we were very powerful and we thought we could shove it down their throat. So, uh, so it's, it's a combination of those factors that led us to pursue what I think was ultimately uh, a foolish policy. We've talked about how wars get started. How do you hope the war in Ukraine ends? What are the ways to end this war? What are the ways to achieve peace there? To uh, end the the, I would say senseless death of young men, as always happens in war. I, I'm sad to say I don't have a good answer to that. Uh, I, I don't think there's any real prospect of a meaningful peace agreement. Uh, I think it's almost impossible. Uh, I, I think the best you can hope for uh, at this point is at some some point in the shooting stops, uh, you have a ceasefire, and then you have a frozen conflict. Uh, and that frozen conflict uh, will not be highly stable. Uh, and uh, the uh, Ukrainians in the West will do everything they can to weaken Russia's position uh, and the Russians will go to great lengths to not only damage that dysfunctional rump state that Ukraine becomes, but the Russians will go to great lengths to sow dissension within the alliance, and, uh, and that includes in terms of transatlantic relations. So you'll have this continuing security competition between Russia on one side and Ukraine and the West on the other, even when you get a frozen peace. Uh, and um, or you get a frozen conflict, and uh, and 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 the potential for escalation there will be great. Uh, so I, I think a, this is a disaster. That's a very realist perspective. Let me ask you, sort of a the the human side of it. Do you think there's some power to leaders sitting down, having a conversation, man to man, leader to leader? about this there's there, there is just a lot of death happening it seems that from an economic perspective from a historic perspective from a human perspective both nations are losing is it possible for vladimir zelensky and, and and vladimir putin to sit down and talk and to uh, figure out a way where uh, the security concerns are addressed and both nations can um Minimize the amount of suffering that's happening, and 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 create a a path towards future flourishing. I think the answer is no. Even with the uh, United States involved, three people in the room. Well, I think you, if the United States is involved, the answer is definitely no. Uh, you have to get the Americans out, uh, and then I I think if you have Zelensky. And Putin talking, you know, you have a sliver of a chance there. The Americans are uh, a real problem. Look, l let's go back to what happens right after the war starts, okay? As I said before, this is, we're talking March, early April of 2022. The war starts on February 24th, 2022. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I said to you, uh, the two sides were negotiating in Istanbul, and they were also uh, negotiating through Naftali Bennett. And the Bennett track and the Turkish track were operating together. I mean, they were not at cross purposes at all. What happened? Bennett tells the story very clearly that they had made significant progress in reaching an agreement. This is Zelensky on one side and Putin on the other. Bennett is talking in person to both Putin and uh, Zelensky. And what happens to produce failure? The answer is the United States and Britain get involved and tell Zelensky to walk. They tell Zelensky to walk. If they had come in and encouraged Zelensky to try to figure out a way with Putin to shut this one down and worked with Bennett and worked with Erdogan, mm -hmm. we might have been able to shut the war down then. Mm -hmm. But it was the United States 
Well, let me sort of uh, push back on that. You're 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 correct, but sort of United States paints this like um, picture that everybody's aligned. So I maybe you can correct me, but I believe in the power of individuals, especially individual leaders. Again, whether it's Biden or Trump or whoever, goes into a room and says in a way that's convincing that no more NATO expansion. And actually just on a basic human level, ask the question of why are we doing all this senseless killing? And look at the interest of one, Russia, look at the interest of the other, Ukraine. Their interests are pretty simple. And say, the United States is gonna stay out of this. We're not going to expand NATO. And say all that in a way that's convincing which is NATO expansion is silly at this point. China is the big threat. We're not going to do this kind of uh, conflict escalation with Russia. The Cold War is over. Let's let's uh, normalize relations. Well, let me just embellish your argument, mm -hmm. okay? Thank you. <laughs> that, that I need it. <laughs> if we say there's a sliver of a chance yes. that you can do this, and I do think there is a sliver of a chance. Let me just embellish your point. Thank you. Uh, I need all the help I can get. Two things have to be done here, in my opinion. One is uh, Ukraine has to become neutral. It, and it, it has to completely sever all security ties with the West, mm -hmm. right? It, it, it's not like uh you can say we're not going to expand nato to include ukraine but we're going to continue to have some loose security arrangement with ukraine none of that it has to be completely severed ukraine has to be on its own okay and number two ukraine has to accept the fact that the russians are going to keep the four oblasts that they've now annexed and crimea Right. The Russians are not going to give them back. And what you really want to do, if you're Zelensky or who's ever running Ukraine in this scenario that we're positing, is you want to make sure the Russians don't take another four oblasts mm -hmm. to include Kharkiv and Odessa. Right. If I'm playing Putin's hand and this war goes on, I'm thinking about taking four more oblasts. I want to take about 43% of Ukraine and annex it to Russia, right? And I certainly want Odessa, uh, and I certainly want Kharkiv. And I, I want the two oblasts in between as well. Right? Literally or as uh, leverage in negotiation no, for I, Ukraine I, neutrality? I want them literally. Uh, I, I want to conquer them literally. Uh, but my point to you is if we can begin to— Talk about cutting a deal now. You may be able to head that kind of aggression off at the pass. Yeah. In other words, you may be able to limit Putin and Russia to annexing the four oblasts that they've now annexed plus Crimea. That's the best I think you can hope for. But the point is you have to get the Ukrainians to accept that. You have to get the Ukrainians to accept becoming a truly neutral state and conceding that the Russians keep a big chunk of territory. It's about 23% of Ukrainian territory that they've annexed. And I find it hard to imagine any Ukrainian leader agreeing to that. Well, there, there, there could be more nuanced things like no military involvement between the United States and Ukraine, but economic involvement, sort of uh, financial support, sort of normalizing economic relationships with Ukraine, with Russia, I think, I think you could probably get away with that. I, I think that the, the tricky question there that you would have to answer is what about EU expansion, right? And I think EU expansion is probably a no-no for the Russians because most people don't recognize this, but there is a military dimension built into EU expansion. Mm -hmm. It's not purely an economic uh, alliance uh, or relationship or institution, whatever word you want to use. There's a military dimension to that. And in the run-up to the war, uh, actually in the run-up to the 2014 crisis when it first broke out, uh, the Russians made it clear they saw EU expansion as a stalking horse mm 
for NATO expansion. So EU expansion is tricky. But I, I think your point of close economic relations between uh, or healthy economic relations, to use a better term, between Ukraine and the West it is possible. I, I think the Russians have a vested interest in, if, if it's a neutral Ukraine, they have a vested interest in that Ukraine flourishing. But that then brings us back to the territorial issue. Right? Well, so do you believe it's possible for individual human relations to counteract the structural forces that you talk about? So meaning the leaders being able to pick up the phone and make agreements that are good for humanity as a whole and for their individual nations in the long term. I, I think leadership matters here. Uh, I mean, one of the real problems here is that there's no trust and uh, on the Russian side, and that has to do with the Minsk agreements. Um, the uh, uh, the Minsk agreements, uh, which were designed to shut down the civil war uh, in eastern Ukraine, in the Donbass, um, really mattered to the Russians. And there were four players involved in the... Uh, uh, the Minsk process, uh, four main players, Russia and Ukraine, of course, and then Germany and France. And uh, I believe the Russians took the Minsk Accords seriously. Uh, I believe Putin took them very seriously. He wanted to shut down that conflict. Uh, and uh, Angela Merkel, Francois Hollande, he was the French leader, and Poroshenko, who was the Ukrainian leader. Those were the three key players besides Putin. Again, Hollande from France, Merkel from Germany, and Poroshenko from Ukraine have all explicitly said they were not seriously interested in reaching an agreement in all of the discussions with Putin. They were bamboozling him. They were trying to trick him so that they would buy time to build up Ukraine's military. Uh, Putin is profoundly upset about these admissions by these three leaders. He believes he was fooled into thinking that Minsk could work. He believes that he negotiated in good faith and they did not. And he believes that the level of trust now between Russia uh, and the West is virtually zero as a result of this experience over Minsk. I only bring this up because it cuts against your argument that leaders could pick up the phone and talk to each other and trust each other, at least somewhat, mm -hmm. uh, to work out a meaningful deal. If you're Putin at this point in time, trusting the West is not an idea that's going to be very attractive at all. In fact, you're going to distrust anything they say. Yeah, distrust anything the West say, but there is individual humans. The way human nature works is when you sit sitting across from a person, you can trust a human being while still distrusting the West. I mean, I, I, I believe in the power of that. I, I think with the right leaders, you can sit down and well, talk. Like over override the general structural distrust of the West and say, you know what, I like this guy or gal, whatever. I do hope Zelensky and Putin sit down together and talk, have multiple talks. Just remember they were doing that in March and the Americans came in and the British came in. Yeah. And they scotched a potential deal. Well, uh, the other beautiful thing about human nature, there's forgiveness and there's uh, trying again. When you're the leader of a country in an anarchic system, you have to be very careful not to let uh, your trust in a foreign leader take you too far. Because if that foreign leader betrays you or betrays your trust and stabs you in the back, you could die. And again, you want to remember that the principal responsibility of any leader, I don't care what country it is, is to ensure the survival of their state. And that means that, you know, trust is only going to buy you so much. And when you've already betrayed the trust of a leader, uh, 
you really are not going to be able to rely on trust very much to help you moving forward. Now, you disagree with that? I hope you're right. And if they can shut down the Ukraine-Russia war, uh, it would be wonderful. If, if I'm proved dead wrong, uh, that would be wonderful news. Uh, my, uh, my prediction that this war is going to go on for a long time and, uh, and end in an ugly way is a prediction that I don't like at all. Uh, so I hope I'm wrong. You wrote that many in the West believe that the best hope for ending the Ukraine war is to remove Vladimir Putin from power, but you argue that uh, this isn't the case. Can you explain? Well, a lot of people thought when uh, they were having all that trouble, the Russians were having all that trouble with Prigozhin and the Wagner group that Putin was vulnerable and was likely to be overthrown. And what would happen is uh, a peace-loving leader would replace Putin. Uh, I made two points at the time, and I would make those same two points now. Number one, he's not likely to be overthrown. Mm -hmm. uh, he was not likely then to be overthrown. Uh, and I think, you know, as long as his health holds up, I think he will remain in power. My second point is, if he doesn't remain in power and he's replaced, I would bet a lot of money that his replacement will be more hawkish and more hardline than Putin is. Uh, I actually think one could argue that Putin was too trusting of the West before the war started, uh, and number two, I think one could argue that he has not waged the war against Ukraine as vigorously as one might have expected. Uh, he was slow to mobilize the nation for war, uh, and he has pursued a limited war in all sorts of ways. Uh, the Israelis, for example, have killed more civilians in Gaza in one month than the Russians have killed over 18 months in Ukraine. The idea that Vladimir Putin is waging a punishment campaign and killing on purpose large numbers of civilians is simply not true. Uh, all this is to say that uh, I would imagine that if Putin leaves office and someone else comes in to replace him, that someone else will be at least, if not more hardline than him in terms of waging the war and certainly will not trust the West any more than he has. By way of advice, let me ask you, if I were to have a conversation, interview Vladimir Putin and Zelensky individually, what should I ask them? If you, me, and Vladimir Putin are having a chat, what are good ideas to explore? What are good questions to ask? What are good things to say on or off the mic, once again, that could potentially even slightly lessen the amount of suffering in the world caused by this war? Oh, I think if you get an interview with Vladimir Putin, there's just all sorts of questions you could ask him. And my sense is that Putin is a straight shooter. Uh, he's also very knowledgeable about history, and he has simple theories in his head about how the world works. And I think he would level with you, and all you would have to do is just you know figure out what all the right questions are. And that would not be hard to do, right? Uh, you know, you could ask him, why was he so foolish? This is for, uh, for example, why was he so foolish as to uh, uh, trust uh, uh, Poroshenko, Hollande, and Merkel uh, in, in the Minsk Accords? Uh, you know, why after his famous talk at Munich in 2007, where he made it clear that he was so unhappy with the West, uh, did he continue uh, to, you know, in a very important way, trust the West? Why didn't he mobilize uh, the Russian military before late September 2022? Uh, you know, once the negotiations that we were talking about before uh, involving Istanbul uh, and uh, 
Naftali Bennett, once they broke down, you know, why didn't he immediately mobilize more of the Russian population to fight the war? Just all sorts of questions like that. And then you could ask him questions about, you know, where uh, he sees this one headed. Uh, What's the best strategy for Russia uh, if the Ukrainians will not agree to neutrality, right? Uh, You know, People like John Mearsheimer say, you'll probably take uh, close to half of Ukraine. Is that true? Uh, Does it make sense to take Odessa? And John Mearsheimer also has questions about China, your future relationships with China. Yeah, I mean, one really important question that I would ask him is, if the United States had basically not driven you into the arms of the Chinese, if there had been no war over Ukraine, and the United States had, and its European allies had gone to considerable lengths to create some sort of security architecture in Europe uh, that resulted in you, Vladimir Putin, having good relations with Ukraine. What would your relations with China be? Uh, and, uh, you know, how would you think about that? Uh, so there, there are just plenty of questions uh, you could ask him. Well, Hope burns eternal in my heart, I think probably in Putin's heart and Zelensky's heart, I hope. Because hope is uh, the leap of trust that we've talked about, I think is necessary for de-escalation and for peace. Well, you realize I have, from the beginning, argued for different policies that were all designed to prevent this war from yes. ever happening. Yes. I don't know if you know this, but in 1993, I argued that Ukraine should keep its nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. I was probably the only person in the West who made that argument. And my argument in 1993, this is in foreign affairs, was that there may come the day when Russia thinks about invading Ukraine. And should that day come, it would be very helpful for preventing war if Ukraine had nuclear weapons. So military might is essential for maintaining a balance of power and peace. Well, if you're interested in deterring an adversary, if I'm worried about you coming after me, the best way to deter you is to have military might. And if you're Russia and I'm Ukraine, I'm far weaker than you, right? And having a nuclear deterrent would be very effective at convincing you not to attack me. Because if you attack me, you're threatening my survival. And that's the one circumstance where it is likely that I would use nuclear weapons to defend myself. And given the consequences of nuclear use, you would be reluctant in the extreme to attack me. So that's why I argued in 93 that if Ukraine kept its nuclear weapons, that made war down the road much less likely. And I believe I was correct. And in fact, Bill Clinton who played the key role in forcing Ukraine to give up its nuclear weapons, now says, he has said it publicly, you can find it on YouTube, that he made a mistake doing that. Furthermore, I argued in 2014 that it made eminently good sense not to continue to push to bring Ukraine into NATO because the end result is that Ukraine would be destroyed and Ukraine is being destroyed. So I was deeply interested at the time in making sure that that didn't happen for the good of the Ukrainians, not to mention because stability in Europe is a net positive for almost everybody involved. But people did not listen to me then either. How did nuclear weapons change the calculus of offensive realism because of mutually assured destruction? I mean, it's not just military might. It's just so destructive that you basically can't use nuclear weapons unless you want complete destruction. There's no question that the presence of nuclear weapons makes it much less likely, I'm choosing my words carefully here, much less likely that a great power would aggress against another great power. It doesn't take that possibility off the table, but it makes it much less likely because of the reasons that you articulated. Uh, But with regard to nuclear use, it's an interesting question how you think about nuclear use in a mad world. I mean, your point that we're in a mad world is, (laughs) that's mad capital M-A-D as well as M-A-D 
yes, small both. letters, but let's stick to the capital letters. Yeah. We're in a world of mutual assured destruction. Uh, there's no question that in that world, uh, uh, it, it's uh, unlikely that nuclear weapons would be used. But the way you use nuclear weapons in that world is you use them uh, for manipulation of risk purposes, mm -hmm. demonstration effect. You, you, you put both sides out on the slippery slope. Now, what exactly am I saying here? Let me talk about NATO doctrine during the Cold War. Mm -hmm. We lived in a mad world, United States and Soviet Union, or the Warsaw Pact and NATO, both had an assured destruction capability. So you had mutual assured destruction. If the Warsaw Pact were to invade Western Europe, and here we're talking about West Germany, uh, and NATO was losing the war, we said that we would use nuclear weapons. How would we use nuclear weapons given that we were in a mad world? The argument was that we would use a handful of nuclear weapons against the Warsaw Pact, not, to, not necessarily against their military forces, could be in a remote area. We would use a small number of nuclear weapons mm -hmm. to signal to the Soviets that we were deadly serious about putting an end to their offensive uh, and that we were throwing both sides out on the slippery slope to oblivion. Mm -hmm. In other words, we were manipulating risk. And the last clear chance to avoid Armageddon rested with them. Mm -hmm. And then we would tell them that if you retaliated with a handful of nuclear weapons and you didn't cease your offensive against West Germany, we would launch a small, another nuclear attack. We would uh, explode a handful more of nuclear weapons, all for the purposes of showing you our resolve, right? So this is the manipulation of risk strategy, and a lot of the language I just used in describing it to you is language that Thomas Schelling invented, mm -hmm. right? Now, fast forward to the present. If Russia were you losing in Ukraine, that's the one scenario where I think where Russia would have used nuclear weapons. And the question is, how would Russia have used nuclear weapons? Again, we're assuming that the Russians are losing to the Ukrainians. I believe they would have pursued a manipulation of risk strategy. Mm -hmm. They would have used four or five, three or four, who knows, nuclear weapons. Maybe and, just one in a, r a rural area that kills very few people. Yes, exactly. And basically, that would spook everybody. The Americans. Just the would, mushroom cloud. Yeah, the, it, it's because of the threat of escalation, yeah. right? A, again, you, your point is we're in a mad world. I accept that. Mm -hmm. And if you have limited nuclear use, right, we understand hardly anything about nuclear escalation mm -hmm. because thank goodness we've never had a nuclear war. So once you throw both sides out on the slippery slope, even if you only use one nuclear weapon in your scenario, you don't know what the escalation dynamics look like. So everybody has a powerful incentive to put an end to the conflict right away. Mm -hmm. I might add to you that there were people who believed that we would not even initiate a manipulation of risk strategy in Europe mm -hmm. if we were losing to the Warsaw Pact during the Cold War. Mm -hmm. Both Henry Kissinger, and Robert McNamara said after leaving office that they would not have done it. They would have not initiated nuclear use, even limited nuclear use. That's what we're talking about here. They would rather be red than dead, right? That was the argument. Too risky. Too risky. Yeah. That's exactly right. But if they had used one nuclear weapon in your story or three or four in my story, Everybody would have said, oh, my God, we've got to shut this one down immediately. I only tell you this story or lay out this scenario be as an answer to your question of how you use nuclear weapons in a mad world. And this is the answer. I, this is all very terrifying. Uh, perhaps in part it's terrifying to me because I can see in the 21st century China, Russia, Israel – 
United States using a nuclear weapon in this way, blowing it up somewhere in the middle of nowhere that kills maybe nobody. But I'm terrified of seeing the mushroom cloud and not knowing what, you know, given social media, given how fast news travels, what the escalation looks like there. Just, you know, in, 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 a, in a matter of minutes, how the news travels and how the leaders react. It's terrifying that this, this little demonstration of power, um, the ripple effects of it in a matter of minutes, seconds, what that leads to. Because it's like, it's human emotions. It's like, you, you see the landscape of human emotions, the leaders and the populace and the, and the way news are reported, and then the landscape of risk, as you mentioned, shifting like the world's most intense nonlinear dynamical system. <laughs> and it, it, it's just terrifying because the, 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 the entirety of human civilization hangs in the balance there. And it's like, like this, like hundreds of millions of people could be dead. Let's just talk about this in the context of the Ukraine war. Um, if, uh, if the Russians were losing, as I said before, which is not the case anymore, but in 2022, it, it did look like that. Um, if the Russians are losing and they turn to nuclear weapons, the question is, how do they use them? And they would use them in Ukraine. And because Ukraine has no nuclear weapons of its own, Ukraine cannot retaliate. It's not a mutual assured mm -hmm. destruction world. It's a case where one side has nuclear weapons and the other doesn't. That means that the Russians are likely to think that they can get away with using nuclear weapons in ways that would not be the case if they were attacking NATO. And therefore, it makes nuclear use more likely. Okay, that's point one. Mm -hmm. Point two is, let's assume that the Russians use two or three nuclear weapons in a remote area. My palms are sweating, by the way. Just, <laughs> just as a commentary. The question, it's terrifying. Yeah, the question then is, what does the West do? Now, Macron has said, and Biden has also, I think, implicitly made this clear, we would not retaliate with nuclear weapons if the Russians were to attack with a handful of nuclear weapons in Western Ukraine. But then the question is, what would we do? Mm -hmm. And if you listen to David Petraeus, what David Petraeus says is that we should attack the Russian naval assets in the Black Sea and attack Russian forces in Ukraine. Well, once you do that, you have a great power of war. You have NATO versus Russia, which is another way of saying you have the United States versus Russia. We're now in a great power of war. They have nuclear weapons. We have nuclear weapons. They've used nuclear weapons. What is the happy ending here? And just to take it a step further and go back to our earlier discussion about moving NATO up to Russia's borders. The point I made, which you surely agree with, is that the Russians are very fearful when they see NATO coming up to their border. Well, here's a case where not only has NATO come up to their border, but they're in a war with NATO right on their border. What do the escalation dynamics look like there? You know what the answer is? Who knows? That should scare the living bejesus out of you, right? And some of it could be, like you mentioned, unintended. There could be unintended consequences. There could be a Russian missile misses and hits Poland. No, the, the, uh, these kinds of things that just escalate misunderstandings, miscommunications, even a, I mean, nuclear weapon could be, boy, it could have been planned to go location X and it went to a location Y that ended up actually killing a very large number of people. I mean, uh, just <laughs> that the, the escalation that happens, there just happens in, in a matter of minutes. And the only way to stop that is communication between leaders. And that to me is a big argument for ongoing communication. You know, there's a story that during the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, Kennedy put out the word, uh, no aircraft uh, 
under any circumstances or to penetrate Soviet airspace. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And he then found out a few days later that uh, some guy hadn't gotten the message and had penetrated uh, in an aircraft yeah. deep into Soviet airspace. Yeah. And uh, this supports your basic point that, you know, uh, bad things happen. Yeah. And, uh, and again, the overarching point here is we've never done this before, thankfully. Therefore, we don't have a lot of experience as to how it plays itself out. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's really a theoretical enterprise because there's no empirical basis for talking about escalation, uh, you know, in a nuclear crisis. And that, of course, is a wonderful thing. Well, in general, the, uh, the human species as a whole is a, is a one-off is a theoretical enterprise, the survival of the human species. You know, we've seen empires rise and fall, but we haven't seen the human species rise and fall. So far it's been rising, but uh, it's not obvious that it doesn't end. In fact, I think about aliens a lot, and the fact that we don't see aliens makes me suspect that it's not so easy to survive in this complicated world of ours.